even though I'm giving a tutorial on this topic, I'm not really expert in this area yet, okay? I'm learning uh, as time goes by. And I got interested in this area basically because I was working with engineers uh, in image and signal processing problems. And they always talk about artificial neural networks, basic networks, all this, you know, high sounding names, obviously, right? And uh, if one knows what they are doing, and when understand understands the you know, the nomenclature, you can do you can help them a lot more than without knowing what they are doing. Okay, so essentially, what I'm going to do is somehow basically go through the introduction of this whole area of Bayesian belief networks, or Bayesian networks, and and uh, point out what they you know, whatever we call in our language, what do they call the same thing? Essentially, and how do they go about solving problem? Not giving any details at all. Give you some references about uh, on this topic. Some very current references, which can lead you to you know other papers which are very useful and for details purposes especially. Okay. So, uh, and uh, sometimes it might sound like you know mm, I don't know what I'm talking about, and that may be the truth also. Okay. So <laughs> essentially. Uh, okay. Uh, so here's the it's just the second. Just to introduce that, make it focus my. Okay. This is the tilted screen. Is it doing that or what? My screen. Do you email us change? Hmm? Do you email us change? No. Okay. I put an email address here for everybody to note down. In case you have any questions later on and you want, or want to just contact me for some, some other piece of information which I can help you with. I'll be glad to do that, okay? So essentially, uh, one of the things I hope happens as part of this workshop is that if you have questions you want to really uh, answer by one of the, you know, uh, so-called experts here, uh, Professor Zellner, he's an expert, yeah. right? And obviously it's, prof and then, you know, Wolfgang Bozak and then, you know, mm, Bill Griffith, me, at least, I believe all of us are willing to help you out in case you have questions, okay? And if you have questions, use email as a medium to uh, contact us. Uh, certainly, we'll try to do our best. Hopefully, it will you know, make you, keep you going in this direction and make future contributions, all right? So that my email address, this is like the generic address. I have other addresses which are have more precise, but this one will always get to wherever I am on a given machine, okay? That's why it's a generic address, goel.1 at you got edu. It's simple to remember also in, in a sense. So uh, that's just the introduction part. What are we just trying to do? As I promised in this, uh, I mean at least in my, not promise, mentioned that uh, in my uh, early information to um, Professor Rao that I'll talk about in the second lecture two things. Learning in Bayesian networks a tutorial and also uh, I think what's happening is this thing because that screen is tilted this okay I have to be careful about that. Measuring information is just an experiment and it's and depending on how much time I take on the first one okay I may not really do much in the second one at all uh, because uh, one hour in each of them may be made basically do injustice to both of them right so what I'm going to do is take as much as time as I need for this one. And then basically, I have written a very recent review paper in this area, uh, which if you want to have a copy of that, I'll send you one, okay? So at least, uh, at least uh, what is available in the context of how does one measure information in a statistical experiment? I mean, you have heard a lot of things like Fisher information, uh, callback level information, right? Uh, basically, uh, based on entropy measure, but there are all, there's a whole class of measurement available. And in general, it depends on how you're going to use the data that decides how much information you have in the experiment. Information is not uniquely de determined, and the purpose of the experimentation, how you use the data, will also decide how you use the experiment. For example, if you have squared error loss, your information, basically, information, basically, reduction in the mean squared error, reduction in the Variance, posterior variance. Whereas if you have, if you have 
classes like Professor Zelotak are again basically asymmetric classes, then obviously reduction variance is not going to be useful thing to do because then last function being asymmetric or balanced last function. In those cases, you want to measure if I do an experiment, how much can I learn from experiment in terms of how much information, how much loss on the average I can I reduce in okay, So this is the area where which is very close to my interest in terms of Professor Degree's work and my work together. And I have a review paper which I'll send to you obviously if you want one. Uh, and I may not spend much time at all this at all. But at least it looks like I'll probably not cover that. I'm just covering this area. All right. All right. Learning with Bayesian networks. Uh, one of the more recent reference on this topic is a, a, a volume which is an edited volume by Michael Jordan. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you can think of Michael Jordan really, you know. <laughs> Michael Jordan, besides baseball, also does stochastic networks. No, he does not. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Michael Jordan is a professor at MIT. No, so this right. It's not. It's, not, it's a different Michael Jordan. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, the, and that's an that interesting name to have same name with a person who is very very famous in uh, sports and and media and everything else. And this is a volume entitled "Learning in Graphical Models." It's published by. I mean, it's a paperback volume published by MIT Press. There's a original volume which is published uh, in a hardcover, expensive volume, but this is fairly inexpensive. And uh, it has a collection of papers and some tutorials on different topics, all right? So it's a fairly nice volume of things uh, to pursue if you're interested in the area. And uh, this looks like, I have, to, I have a copy of that. Like this volume, basically a paper by volume. It's almost $20, $30, probably it's even cheap here in, the, you know, in Asian countries because MIT Press does put out things on a, an expensive cost. But this is not too expensive. And it has really nice collection of papers in this area. And it's more recent, very recent, just came out you know, last year sometime, very, you know, around, I bought it in August, and maybe it came out in you know, January, February kind of thing. So uh, it's something worth looking at. Uh, uh, and so, um, with this, another paper, this is a paper that I'm going basically to base my talk on, and put a tutorial on, is Hackerman, David Hackerman. Uh, he's a very famous name in this AI area. AI, so this area also is something called AI, artificial intelligence, okay? It's basically uh, one of the tools in AI is Bayesian networks, all right? And David Hackerman is fairly well known in the name of, in the area of AI, in the area of data mining. He is at Microsoft Research, okay? Uh, so uh, Microsoft Research has a very strong group in uh, so-called data mining, Bayesian uh, methods, and AI. And uh, David Hackerman is one of the members of that group. The other papers in this volume, which are very useful. The first one, which is the first chapter here, especially the first chapter, is again entitled, let me just say what the title is, because uh, I mean, you can read that, but uh, it's called Introduction to Inference for Bayesian Networks. Okay? And I'll define that term. What do they mean by inference for Bayesian Networks? All right? I mean, this is, some, this is a very high sounding name. But it has a very simple meaning, right? We'll come to that. So that chapter is very nice because it talks about what are the computational tools available for making inference for these kind of networks when the network is large. I mean, a lot of the effort is very, really geared towards complex problems where the network is very, very large, number of variables involved is very large, right? And therefore, even though in principle you can write down the base theorem and how to update the probabilities, but to do the computations for a large network, you may be talking about, you know, 10,000 variables. To compute, even just to the, obtain the base, uh, you know, results from base theorem, takes a lot of time, computationally. And these people, people in computation worry about, for a large network, what are the, I mean, how much time you consume, how, much, how complex the model is, and how much time you consume, and therefore they worry about how to simplify computations, and those kind of things, essentially. And, the tool they use graphical networks because there you can write down clearly with a given network what kind of conditional independence are available, which you are asserting basically through your model. 
I will go through details of that, okay? So essentially, this first chapter also is pretty good in this book. Uh, and all these things, I mean, are basically interchangeable things. Based on belief that verse AI, HMM, is called hidden Markov models, okay? This, is, and I, this area is, again, and this tool is very useful and very highly used tool in engineering these days. And speech recognition, all kinds of you know, basically signal processing, they use HMM models. And again, if you know what they mean, things are not that bad. Essentially, not knowing what they mean, you think, boy, this is something really, you know, God-given tool now. It's all, in the basic framework, it all becomes very simple, okay, what it means. And then you know how to turn the brain, basically in crank any way. Except that for large networks, you have to be careful about that you have computational power to compute the things you want to compute, right? And the computer science people in this area worry about uh, the rate and the complexity of these problems, okay? Uh, people in uh, engineering simply apply them to given data sets, they apply them. Uh, and obviously, they have to write down the model first. That's the most important part. The mo once you have the model, the rest of the things that we know, once you have the model, the model for the prior and for the data, Thus, things are turning the base and handle, which may a little bit more may take more time because you have large model. Okay. However, essentially, it's not something mm, uh, not something we as statisticians will worry about because well, I know the base theorem, I know how to write it down. But then it's all things practical. On the other hand, when model is very complicated, you may worry about how do I simplify my computations or how do I approximate them. Okay. Uh, so that's the kind of things. Uh, some of these people worry about in the area, okay? If you have any questions, just please raise your hand and I'll, and I'll try to answer immediately if I can. Now, with this one more reference, uh, again, uh, this is a book, and <coughs> it's a book entitled Glymore and Cooper. It's they're the editors. Glymore and Cooper, Computation, Causation, and Discovery. Look at the, the high sounding title, okay? This is again by, uh, this uh, book by, this is a collection of papers again. And this is a book from MIT Press again. MIT Press is very active in this home area, okay? So they, they have media group, and they're publishing all kinds of, media group is a research group basically, okay? They're publishing all kinds of books in this area. And this book again has collection of uh, papers which are very relevant, uh, you know, some of the papers are very relevant to what we're talking about. And one of the specific papers which I want to refer to you is chapter 11. Uh, in this chip, uh, in this book, and the title of that uh, uh, chapter is "Modeling Corn Exports and Exchange Rates with Directed Graphs." It's an application paper, okay? And they talk about and so it's a basically basic networks and statistical loss function. They use that to model corn exports and exchange rates. So this is chapter 18 in this book, and this is basically the application paper. Did I use the right pen? No, that's not the right pen. Uh, corn exports and exchange rates. I mean, basically, they're trying to connect these two things because obviously exports are very much connected to exchange rates. If it's very expensive for the people to buy it, they will buy less, okay? If it's very cheap, they'll buy more. And therefore, they're trying to look at this thing with directed graphs. And um, as you see uh, in a minute, Vector graphs are nothing but uh, Bayesian belief network. Bayesian network. They have dropped the word belief now. It used to be belief before, but now it's gone from the uh, lexicon. Statistical loss functions. Interesting paper to read if you're, you know, interested in applications. And so that's one uh, reference which has few papers available. But then even this paper by uh, Hackerman really has lots of references. Okay, because it's a more recent paper and gives you a lot of references of what's going on in the area. And you will see when you will go through the names, you'll recognize a lot of names of statisticians because they're the ones who did some of the fundamental work in conditional independence. And those algorithms are now being used in this area to really simplify computations, right? Okay, this is the references part. So if you want to read more, how do you do that? <coughs> so the first question is then, uh, What is Bayesian network? Bayesian network is a graphical model 
that encodes probabilistic re relationships among variables of interest. That's the I mean, very simple thing. It's a device to specify uh, the joint distribution of all the variables in the model through through basically not worrying about joint distribution, but through worrying about conditional distribution. Okay? You look at conditional distributions and see how can I write down joint distribution via a product of some conditionals. Right? That's what uh, is basically network is. And uh, we'll be more specific later on a little bit. Popularity has increased with increasing uses of these networks in representing uncertain expert knowledge in AI. So basically, this whole thing started out with if I'm an expert. And me, if and me, an expert, how does he or she state all these joint distribution of high dimensional problem, prior distributions? Okay, so that's why we're based in the belief networks because try to specify uh, your beliefs in large dimensional model. If you ask them, somebody, I uh, have a thousand variables, give me the joint distribution of these variables. Can't do that, right? Impossible. So you have to somehow reduce the problem to so. Uh, specifying distribution of one or two variables at a time, given some everything else, so that you can handle a small dimensional problem. Okay, so trying to reduce a large dimensional problem into conditional distributions which are fairly small dimension. Okay, and then assuming something about the joint uh, in the conditional dimension here, assuming something about the underlying uh, structure of the model, you can then have the full joint distribution. Okay, that's what uh, we are talking, they're doing basically. So this became quite popular in AI. This is one of the tools they're using. Other tools are basically what they call Dempster Schaefer error, you know, which I'm not going to talk about. So, so those other two tools. The third is what they call, talk about fuzzy logic, okay? That's in the area, fuzzy logic area. So the three tools, Dempster Schaefer, Bayesian, belief networks, and fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic is really fuzzy, okay? <laughs> How many days basically? It has at least to a base unit will not make any sense at all, okay? I mean, people who use it and claim it works, it's fine, but it's very little theory attached to it in terms of how to evaluate the performance under uncertainty of these kind of things. But they claim they can do a lot more than basics too. But you know, if you look at the first thing, if you look at what they're doing, basics average over things, right? When they want to make some inference, they make, take averages, or they integrate things out. In fuzzy logic, usually they maximize over, and they simply maximize and take it some minimax kind of approach. Okay, so essentially, uh, I tried to read about that and it did not make much sense. As if I'll keep it away for at least for a while. Okay, so essentially, this area is, uh, this became quite popular as a Bayesian belief at first, but then they realized you can do full Bayesian modeling, just not the prior part. You have data available. You can write the joint distribution data and the prior and the parameters, and then you can do the full thing. You can learn from the data. And, and like we do, we, as a statistician, we knew that. But then they realize, once you have this models based on expert beliefs and knowledge only, you can now combine them with data. And so they say uh, prior to belief networks, and then uh, distribution of data given the parameters, and then you know what Bayesians do. So there's a Bayesian techniques plus Bayesian belief networks became Bayesian networks. Okay, that's how the belief was dropped out from there because it's about now combining data and, and, and the prior uh, both into doing full fledged analysis of a problem, right? Okay, and uh, so what it is, it's a marriage between probability theory and graph theory. Okay, that's what, uh, that's what the, the, this is marriage in these two areas. It's a natural tool for dealing with two common problems. What are those? Uncertainty and complexity. So those are two problems in a large, you know, any large problem. You have uncertainty because the world is not certain and you, know what, you don't know what's going to happen, number one. And number two, the systems are very complex, large complex systems. And how do you deal with them? Well, either there is data or there are assumptions, right? You make assumptions, you can simplify your problem. And, uh, and under those assumptions, if there is reasonable assumptions, under those assumptions you then have uh, uh, at least uh, this model, which is workable model for the system at hand. Okay, that's why these two things. And what happens is, you deal this probability theory. This complexity part you deal with a graphical structure of the of the system. Okay, and then once then you have two those two things. You have a paradigm to some, um, solve some real problems. Okay. 
Okay. I mean, this is already playing an increasingly important role in the design and analysis of machine learning area. Machine learning is something, another word you'll hear a whole lot among the engineers, okay, and computer scientists. Machine learning basically is, think about pattern recognition as a classification problem. That's what we call classification, right? How do you do classification for a large complex system automatically when you don't have to worry about, you know, writing your distributions down and trying to do analysis on paper, computing style, given the structure of the model. So basically, this is a uh, this is an area which is very popular. There are journals on that area now available, and that's something. These networks are playing a very important role in that whole area. Okay, and. Uh, Essentially, if you want to learn about it, it's not very difficult. If you have a you know, statistical background, you can learn about that. Then uh, working with the engineers, you can you know, help them out in solving the problem, hopefully a bit better than they will do themselves, or what you will do it by yourself. Working together, you can do a lot more in this kind of things than either discipline by yourself, OK? <coughs> OK. Uh, so then you can say, well, there are two tools, probability and graphic and graphic graph theory. Why graph theory? Why graphical models? Why should you be using that? Okay, I have to do it this way. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, why graphical models? The idea is the notion of modularity. You build a complex system by combining simpler parts. That's what you're doing, okay? And uh, you can do it through the graphical structure, you can talk about it. you can do that. And then why marry the probability theory? Well, because probability theory provides the glue. That's the glue for combining parts together. Okay, you have parts, simple parts, and then from combine them, you need some kind of glue, probably to replace that glue part. Okay, so essentially you do the, uh, you use the, this graphical structure, use your uh, inference or learning based on probability theory, and you have a system model. So system is a whole, it provides a framework where system as a whole is consistent, or coherent. Remember that in the first lecture here, when our, as our keynote, not, our distinguished guest, uh, Satish Chandra, right? What's his name? Professor Dr. Satish Chandra talked about policymakers trying to make coherent policies. And for doing coherent policy, you really need a coherent structure for your model. Okay? If your model is not coherent, whatever you do won't, won't make sense anyway, right? If you, I mean, if you have the same problem and you go approach the problem in different directions, condition different variables, and you end up with different inferences, there's some lack of coherence in the problem, okay? And you can't afford to do that if you want to make coherent policy. That's why. This network, this structure now, this and this together gives you as basically a Bayesian framework, right, to make coherent <coughs> inferences about a complex system, right? Remember that you are making a lot of assumptions, are assertions there as they call it. They don't call they use the word assumption. They call it assertions. You're making you're asserting that certain variables <coughs> given certain other variables are independent, conditionally independent. Okay, so uh, assertion is a substitution for assumption, right? But make sure you're making an assumption, and if your assumption is not right, obviously your model won't be very good. So that's what something uh, one has to be, you know, keep in back of mind. All these models are based on assumptions, and, and we know very well if our assumptions are not are not very good, what you end up with is a garbage, right? That's what I'm asking. So, uh, but I said nice framework. It's being used successfully. <coughs> Provided you think about the problem correctly. You think of the problem, see what the components are, how do you put together the components. Once you have done that, you have a successful outcome uh, from, the, uh, from this thing. What yeah. do you mean by coherent? Oh, OK. Uh, coherent. What do you mean by coherent? OK, good. I didn't ask that question, right? I have answered it now already here. <laughs> All right. Coherent, basically what he's saying is, in the, I mean, in the Bayesian frame of coherent systems, any, any a statement of prob probabilities so that you do not get a contradiction when you use the uh, axiomatic calculation of probabilities. Okay. So you have all the probabilities that we make are coherent, because then in that case you don't get any contradiction. That's one, okay? In non-probability terms, you can think about coherent system being simply no contradictions when you look at different conditioning variables and making inferences and end up with the same inference on the top. Remember what happens in contingency tables. If you make some conditioning and you try to marginalize that, so maybe some contradiction in this case. That shouldn't be happening in a coherent system. And I, uh, there is a very specific 
Bayesian definition says any collection of bets you make, you make it probability specifications, and now you're trying to combine those specifications into collection of bets. You should not, you should never have what? What's called uh, uh, almost sure winning, right? Strategy. Somebody call chorus, right? You do not have an almost sure winning strategy because then you can really beat somebody almost surely uh, in that sense. And that's what you get by having a model, uh, this system and probability theory, you're building a model which will not lead to contradictions. Okay? All right. Uh, so first thing is, gives it ensures the system is coherent, number one, or consistent, internally consistent, okay? And second thing it does is provides ways to in interface model with data. We know in the basic framework you can really do that very easily. You have our uh, prior knowledge and data, and we know how to combine them, right? And that's what this framework is giving you. Because you're using probability theory, you're saying, basically what you're saying is the observables and the non-observables all can be thought of as a joint probability distribution, okay? And then, therefore, you end up with a system which is coherent or consistent, and also you get a uh, ways to combine information and also therefore you make uh, uh, make uh, inference about the parameters from the data in a basic framework. Okay, I have to go ahead again now. Now what happens as you know as an econometrician or a statistician you know many classical multivariate probability systems basically in statistics, system engineering, information and communication theory and all these areas, but in recognition area statistical mechanics are basically uh, um, on those areas these are all become special cases of a general graphical model because essentially you can put any kind of multivariate relationship in a graphical model that's what you're saying essentially okay and uh, it's a way of thinking nothing more it's a way of thinking about models uh, via graphical structures and therefore uh, you can put any kind of multivariate a probability system in this kind of framework, and therefore it provides you a way, uh, a, a way of thinking about uh, how to write down your joint distributions in some kind of a structured fashion. Okay? So examples that you have is mixture models. You can put them in this framework very easily. Factor analysis. Causal model. This is one, this area has been around for, in, in social science for a long time. Causal modeling, okay? And that's something we have to be careful. When you say causal modeling, it doesn't mean they say, like you can discover causes from statistical analysis or anything, okay? The cause is used, cause, the A causes B, it doesn't really mean in the actual cause and effect sense. It's basically always probabilistic, like in a regression sense. If you change, I don't know, Y given X, change X, Y will change in a, some kind of trend fashion, okay? Uh, so, uh, cause is a word which, I mean, you philosophically, when you say cause and effect, then you know A causes B then B can't cause A anymore, right? So it's not that kind of uh, modeling, but they call it causal modeling in that area, uh, in, uh, basically in social behavioral sciences. Uh, so hidden marker models, basically, they are example of graphs, basically, okay? Latent variable model, when you have something which is not observable, but some, some of your beliefs underlying variable which you Assume if you have measured that, then you have some kind of this conditional independence available to you. It's all, they all, common filters. They're all part of the same thing, basically, okay? View, you can view all these guys as part of a common underlying formalism. It's a formalism which you're using, but then it's a formalism which you can then implement and, and al via algorithms for real problems, okay? Whereby you can then compute things out uh, in automatic fashion. Once you specify the structure, the network is specified, you can compute any probability you want to without any kind of human uh, mm, interference. I mean, so you can write algorithms, algorithms for that and therefore it gives you a uh, nice way of doing things quickly. Okay? <clears throat> now what are the advantages of this whole thing? One of them is because you have all these areas which are basically into one formal and you can put them together. So whatever techniques you have learned in a certain area you can then transfer in other areas. Otherwise people just work in their own discipline reinvent wheel, do the things uh, again and again, whereas if you have common, form, common language, a common formalism, then you can transfer things which have been in one area into another area by, through this formalism. Otherwise, the language are orthogonal. People don't understand what you're saying, and therefore it's difficult to transfer those things into another area, whereas this, it provides, this formalism provides you a way to at least try to transfer things 
into other basic areas, okay? <coughs> and also, uh, you can use this as a, a framework for designing of new systems, okay? Those are advantages. Uh, so just, I think I made a comment already about this thing in the AI community. Mm. They were, they call it belief network first because they were trying to use them to assess expert beliefs in the beginning. But then say models for learning Bayesian networks from data using Bayesian. So basically using Bayesian methods with the prior specified belief networks became now Bayesian networks. So just drop the word belief in that one. These are the current research domain. They're talking about how do you, how do you, I don't know, new algorithms for doing things for class of models, okay? So then you don't have to have every model, you don't have to do the things from scratch. Yeah, this class of model, how do you computations, the software being written for that kind of purpose too, okay? I'll mention some of the things uh, later on too. So uh, this is basically a Bayesian technique for ex extracting and encoding now. Encoding means basically a model which has been specified in a, a graphical form and then you don't have to worry about uh, once that structure is there, you can compute any probability. That's the code for the whole model, okay? <coughs> okay. Uh, a question you could ask is, why should I do that? I mean, I have, in AI, things like rule-based methods, okay? Those are not probabilistic, okay? People use rule-based methods, they use decision trees, they use uh, they use artificial neural networks. These are all things which are in AI area, okay, doing the representation of the uh, problem. And techniques like density estimation, classification, regression, clustering, all those things are, again, you know, available. What is it, what is the extra I'm getting over here? What you're extra getting you get over here is because, basically, as I said, it's a formalism which provides you uh, a, a method for doing things in an algorithmic fashion. And you can use, so, you know, like, Something they use the word called object oriented programming, right? So you can think about that kind of something analog of that. You have this for each so for each class of models you have an object available, you can use that object to do competition. Something I mean there's some vague thing. Now I have a couple of stars over here. What do these stars mean? Classification. Some of you already know uh, this word. They call it supervised learning. We call it classification or final recognition, they call it supervised learning, okay? It's the same thing. All right? Uh, then say clustering, they call it unsupervised learning, okay? So, I mean, those are things which you, once you know about them, you can really talk to them what they are doing and how, what, uh, what are other methods available in uh, your area, in your statistics, which can help doing the job possibly better, right? So that's why, uh, I mean, first, what is supervised learning, I don't know. When they told me what they're doing, I'm, okay, I know what it is, it's classification problem, right? So essentially, uh, when you go into this area, you start reading about that, you'll learn, you see a lot of new terms. They, when this kind of data, okay, ob observation, one observation, right? They call it an example, or a case, not an observation on data, okay? So, and those are the kind of things which are somehow, maybe it's because when they use new terminology, they think they are now, you know, doing completely new research and everything else, whereas if they use observation or classification, they already, people have already done that in certain other area, then it's not new anymore. That's why each area seems to develop its own language, okay? And the language is, I don't know, basically, you need a dictionary now to translate A to B into C. And then things become synthesized, and you, then you know what is going on across areas. And that's what I'm trying to do them. And this year, I have a sort of, a, sort of mm, I mean, I have a grant to not to teach, okay? I'm not, a grant not to teach for a whole year, and work with engineers. <laughs> I work with engineers basically to um, learn myself what's going on in these areas and then uh, develop some long-term research programs to do work jointly. Okay, and, th and that's what uh, you need to invest, spend time, and invest your time in learning the vocabulary first. And that's the most important part. Once you have the vocabulary, you can talk to them and then I mean, you can work <coughs> with them also. And, but that needs special effort to learn the vocabulary. It's just like learning a new language. And you want to use the language, you need to learn that. If you don't learn the language, you can't use it, obviously. And, and you can't communicate with other people. For communication purposes, you need to learn the language, that's it. Okay, that's what happens. And that's what I'm talking about this year also. So um, I learned these two things very early, that what is called supervised and unsupervised learning is simply these two things, okay? 
Then you can ask the question, all right, if I'm going to do that, what is the, what is the other advantage available to me? First thing, if you have, you come across a problem, incomplete data sets all the time, right? I mean, each individual, some other, something is missing. And in general, if you have a, a classical procedure, what does SAS do? SAS do, right? What does SAS do? They throw out cases which are, which are missing up variables, right? Because they can't process them, essentially. But you know, through Bayesian modeling, uh, you can then either use EM kind of techniques, right? Or else you can, once you have a structure written up in the model, you have full model specified, you can use then, basically you can use uh, simulation methods to even consider data sets which have some missing variables. You don't have to throw them out. Because once you throw them out, you're throwing information away. I mean, every case is information. Just because it is incomplete, should not be thrown out from the analysis. And the classical analysis does not give you that framework. It is much difficult, much more difficult. Whereas, once you have a fully specified model, you can incorporate all the observations, whether they are complete or incomplete. So this is a structure you have available, which allows you to then uh, handle, I have, to, I have to stand like that. Let's see what, okay. Mm. That's one thing which allows you to do that. Now this causal relationships are really not in the sense A causes B, okay? They are basically probabilistic causal relationships, okay? These are really not, so that's, I mean, it's being used by engineers too, causal relationship, okay? In, in some, when they call it causal model, that means uh, and the model does not have future observations in there, in time series data, okay? Model is causal, that means it only uses past data, not the future data. That's what they call the causal model in, in signal processing, okay? And uh, again, the word is there, but then you have to, when they say word cause, what are they really? saying what it actually they mean okay uh, so um, in the first signal processing course I took this year and last quarter it's a causal model and I immediately raised my hand well what are you saying causal model what it means well I mean that a model for a time t does not have anything which is not yet measured so model at time t depends on only things have been measured up to time before time t or at time t Nothing before, and nothing after that. So it's like, you know, we know what, what happens with AR models, right? They're, they're talking about AR models kind of thing, right? But again, cause word may have different connotations in different areas. And one has to understand what do they mean by causal model. Okay. Combined knowledge, domain knowledge. So here, domain knowledge can be used basically then to write your priors. Domain knowledge means subject matter expertise along with along with expert belief together can be put together with data and then you have something better than just using data or something better than using just for expert knowledge, okay? I mean, especially we know in cases where data is very scarce or very expensive, we don't have much data and we do have to depend on expert knowledge and beliefs to at least get some idea of what is a reasonable decision to be made, okay? And uh, that's why you cannot I mean, if you ignore prior knowledge, given that it's, you know, it's reasonable prior knowledge, then you're ignoring information. And we know ignoring information is a bad thing, right? More information you have, better off you will be than if you ignore information. That's why this gives you a framework for that. And then, <coughs> Bayesian methods in conjunction with Bayesian network and other models, again, it's a repetition basically. Efficient and principled approach, principled approach, because it's a fully probabilistic approach, to avoid overfitting data too. What happens is uh, in classification problems, when you're trying to develop a classification procedure, what do you do? You have some uh, data set available, you save some for testing purposes, and use the remaining data set for fitting your, fitting your, uh, to your procedure, to the procedure you develop, or training your procedure, right? In a fully basic approach, you don't need to do that, because remember we talked about, in, uh, in the first lecture, we talked about that uh, if you have observations coming over time, you can update your prior to posterior becomes a prior to next stage and so on. So you have a structure whereby you can specify the prior, update the prior given the data you have, okay? So you don't necessarily have to save the data set for this purpose. Okay, so implementation, 
uh, of Bayesian networks requires an understanding of Bayesian approach to probability stat, which I hope all of you now know already, right? And you have to, what is called the prior assessment methodology. You have to, I think I should put this direction here. Okay. Now I can do it. Tilt. Right. So, as you will see, I mean, uh, expert has to state a lot of these conditional probabilities in the network, okay? So, one has to be fairly good in assessing probabilities. Let's assume that and as an expert you can do that. And uh, that's required here, okay? So as I know, these are basically advantages I've talked about. Uh, I'll not talk about the prior assessment, you know, Professor uh, Zellner talked about a little bit on that area. And uh, there's a lot of literature in that, okay? Both uh, priors, informative, non-informative priors. And that's the area one has to have go over. And I'm going to basically spend any time on that at all. Okay. Mm. Now, so what is a Bayesian network? I've talked about some way in quote unquote uh, without any define, defining anything. So it addresses relationship, uh, probabilistic, among a large number of variables. Assume that observables data and the unobservables parameters are, uh, what is that thing? Okay, I know what it is. It's all, all <sighs> too many pens for around here. This is right. Are all considered as variables, okay? So you have basically k variables. They could be parameters, they could be observables, everything else is set of variables. And you know what you want is the ultimately a joint distribution specified on this set of variables, okay? So, so what is the Bayesian network then? Is number one a network structure, S, we'll talk about that in a minute, that encodes a set of conditional independence assertions or assumptions among variables in X, okay? So key point here is to write one distribution of all these variables, you want to have some simple code for that from which you can compute all other probabilities of that joint distribution, okay? And so it says network structure S that is encoding, basically this is specifying all possible joint probabilities. If you provide a code for that uh, joint distribution, given that code, you can then compute everything else automatically. Okay, and then what you need is here, in this code, you require what's called local probabilities. Basically, this distribution that every node in the network, what's called local probability distribution. I'll give an example very fast now. What, it, what that means, but once given you have a network structure and the local probability distributions, you say joint distribution is simply the product of the local probability. That's a terminology you Local probability distribution is term your local in the sense that every node, you specify the probability of something happening in that node, and that, that, that variable, taking a specific value, conditional on whatever is in the parent set. And that's again, new term will come in very fast, okay? So xi's are the variables in the problem. We say x1 to xk. And uh, there are also the nodes. For every variable, we have one node in the uh, network, OK? PAI are called the parents of the node xi and s. And I'll give you a very, example, very simple example of just three variable problem, basically. Uh, so these are parents of the node xi and s. And graphic, people who do graph theory know what the parent means. But, uh, but we'll just uh, talk about that. And lack of possible arcs in from node to node means you are specifying conditional independence. Okay? So basically, with a joint distribution system, you can have every variable pointing an arc and everything else. That's a fully connected network. Every node is connected to every other node directly. Okay? Uh, but in that case, you're saying is there is pretty much no conditional independence available to you. Given a set of variables, you can Sometimes you can discover conditional dependence even though they're not there when you see the round, the round ordering of, uh, of variables. Let's see what it means. So what he's saying is the following. If you have a structure available, the parent nodes available to you, joint distribution is simply a product of x size. I go on to do n here times, given this, only this local probabilities, p of x i given the parent nodes, instead of conditioning on everything else. Okay, let's uh, go to that first quickly what it means, okay? Right, let me just do the following. 
example. Give me a simple example here. Um, then we can come back to it. <coughs> Three variables. Right? Three variable problem. And you say, I mean, statistically say something like x1 and x2 are conditionally independent given x3. That's the assertion you make, right? What you're saying is in this case, if you build a regression model between what and what? Given x3, I can say these two are independent. Basically, what I'm saying is the following. This is essentially making. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, this is the following graph there. x3 is the parent node. Given the condition of this variable here, these two are independent. So there's no art from here to here. Uh, because when I condition this variable, in this say I'm graph from x, so this is a cause, this is the effect in their language. Cause, effect, cause, effect. So, which means simply saying conditional x3, these two become independent. Therefore, I can write down, I can write down my, uh, this variable here, p of x3, x1 given x3, otherwise <coughs> what do you get? x1 given x3, and then x2 given x1 x3 both, right? In a full, full cycle, if you write this term distribution, will be conditional, this is the marginal here, x1 given x3, and then distribution x2 given x1 and x3. That'll give you the full specification of the problem, problem, this distribution here. But you say this last guy here, and when you condition x3 here, x2 distribution does not depend on x1 anymore. So this is what this assertion is. This assertion says that this last element here simply is same as, so uh, we can say that p of x2 given x3, p of x2 given x3 and x1 is same as p of x2 given x3 for all x1. Right? And that translates into this kind of little, uh, little uh, structure, okay? So this is the parent, uh, parent node of x1 is x3. Of x2 is also x3. So given this parent node, given this parent node, uh, and basically parent node x2 is x3 also, it turns out that these two become independent. I do not have any graph going from here to here anymore. This is what is missing here. Otherwise, it could have been complete. You know, we could complete the graph the, this way if we wanted to, but it's not there anymore. So you're saying, given this guy, these two become independent. Okay, that's the assertion you're making. I'll give you a little more example later on. And what do we mean by that? Essentially, when you write this kind of structure, if you think of a simple multivariate normal model for these three variables, what are we saying here? What we're saying here is, if you assume this is a normal model, mu mu is mu one, mu two, mu three. Sigma is this full matrix over here. This has rows, sigma. Sigma squares and row one, row, row one, two, row one, three, row one, row two, three. Those are the main parameters. By making this assertion over here, you're saying is that essentially this row here, which is the correlation x1, x2, is equal to the product of correlation x1, x3, this guy and this guy. So basically, by making this assertion, you're saying the parameters of this model are related in this fashion. So right now, this assertion simply says that you don't have uh, but three variations, three correlations. Right now, you have three variances and two correlations. Because the third one is a function of the other two. So basically, in a multivariate normal structure, any kind of conditional independence leads to a reduction in the number of parameters of your model. That's what you're doing. So when you say something like that, you better be sure that this is true. Otherwise, you're making an assertion which is not necessarily correct. So this is. The assertion of this kind, which they call assertion, is an assumption which says, I can write this correlation over here of this x1, x2 pair as a product of these two correlations. Okay? And uh, I mean, you can write down, given a multivariate normal structure, you can write down any kind of uh, statistical conditional independence, basically, you can write down what its implications are. So, okay? Because you know that given a multivariate normal model, you can write down all this conditional distribution, x1, x given x3, right? x2 given x3, or x1, x2 given x3, the joint distribution, and these two given x3, and from that you can deduce that what you're really saying is, uh, um, in this case, x1, x2 given x3, you can write this distribution down, and there you say they're independent, therefore it will just force this conclusion here, okay? So essentially, you're making, through these conditional independence assumptions, you're making a statement about some of the parameters in that various covariance matrix. I think I'll stop at this point and maybe we can just continue a little bit later on, okay? Take a break at this point.